So, welcome to uh, King's, welcome to the Arts and Humanities Festival. Some of you will have been to other events, some of you might wonder. I'm Gordon McMullen, I'm Professor of Shakespeare Studies here, which proves I know nothing whatsoever about the topic in question. And it's my pleasure to introduce this event. Welcome to this evening's discussion of modern literature. The intersection of mining and literature is a thriving critical field right now, and we're fortunate at King's to have leading scholars working in this area. Um, I'll mention a couple of others who are not uh, speaking this evening, but are in the area. It's Professor Catherine Boyle in the Spanish department, who is working on mining and theatre in Chile, and there is <coughs> Professor Anna Redding, head of the Department of Cultural Media and Creative Industries, who's working with Australian colleagues on mining memories. Um, and we'll hear more about mining in Australia from Philip Mead, our final speaker this evening. Now, when we advertise this session, um, a colleague in the Dean's office, Claire Dowding, got in touch to point out that there are verses on the walls of the chapel here, which is a truly astonishing space. If you've not seen the chapel, you really ought to go and see it. From a section of the book of Job, chapter 28, in which humanity's impact on the earth is described in the following terms. Man's hand assaults the flinty rock and lays bare the roots of the mountains. He tunnels through rock. His eyes see all its treasures. He searches the sources of the rivers and brings hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where can understanding dwell? So for the Bible, it seems that mining and learning are interconnected. And if you want to go and see the verses, they're on the wall of the chapel. This colleague also pointed out that tonight's event takes place by entirely by coincidence and not design, on the 48th anniversary of the Aberfan mining disaster, when in 1966, the catastrophic collapse of a colliery spoil tip in a tiny Welsh village led to the deaths of 116 children and 28 adults. And she adds a further curious coincidence, which again, we did not know, when this lecture <coughs> was booked for this event. As it happens, she said, Professor J.K.T.L. Nash, after whom this lecture theatre is named, appeared as an expert witness at the Aberfan Tribunal, which was held after the disaster to find out what happened and who should be held responsible. The conclusion of the tribunal being that the blame lay with the National Coal Board, for whom, I'm sorry to report, Professor Nash was appeared. <laughs> That's a little unfortunate, but there we are. <laughs> Our first talk this evening will be about another mining accident, one that took place across the Atlantic at the end of the 19th century. And both of these events serve to remind us of the grief and the loss that is so often the focus of writing about mining, as each of our speakers will remind us. The format is that each speaker will speak for 20 minutes, and there will be time for interrogation of all the speakers at the end. So please keep your burning questions until then. But let me introduce them. Janet Floyd is reader in American studies here at King's. Much of her work is focused on the American West in the 19th century, looked at both transatlantically and globally. The main focus of her interest lies in the ways in which everyday routines surface in different kinds of text, private, popular, and literary writing, as well as different types of image. Her publications include two monographs, Writing the Pioneer Woman of 2002, and Claims and Speculations, Mining and Writing in the Gilded Age in 2012, and she's published three co-edited collections of essays. Tonight, she'll be speaking under the heading An Accident in the Klondike, 1899. Rosalind Buckland is a PhD student in the English department here at King's. <coughs> she previously studied at Cambridge before completing her research master's at Edinburgh. She's currently the convener of the abstract and city-centric reading groups here at King's. Her talk this evening is entitled Accidental Murder, Industrial Injury in the Dickensian Coal Mine. She's working on depictions of mining in British fiction from Dickens to D.H. Lawrence. And she's supervised by the next speaker, Adeline, who is also, as you will have seen, a Buckland, though no relation. It never occurred to me when I was a PhD student, but I have to say to insist that my supervisor change his name to be the same as mine, so I clearly wasn't demanding enough. Adeline Buckland is a lecturer at <coughs> here at King's. She came to us from the University of East Anglia in 2012, and prior to that, she studied or taught at the universities of Cambridge, Oxford, and Birmingham. Her primary research interest is in the intersections of literature and the history of science. And her monograph, Novel Science, Fiction and the Invention of 19th Century Geology, was published last year to glowing reviews, I'll embarrass it by saying, by the University of Chicago Press. She's now working on writing about coal, gold, diamond, and lead mining in the 19th century. 
her talk this evening is called Occult Geology, Ghosts, Gnomes, and Gemstones in the History of the Earth. Finally, Philip Mead is Winthrop Professor and Inaugural Chair of Australian Literature at the University of Western Australia in Perth. His research in Australian literature lies at the intersections of literary studies, cultural geography, <coughs> history, literary education, and digital humanities. He's published widely on Australian literature, especially poetry, and he co-edited the Penguin Book of Modern Australian Poetry with the poet John Tranter. He is himself also an accomplished poet. His monograph, Network Language, History and Culture in Australian Poetry, won the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Literary Scholarship in 2010. His talk will be on Indigenous Literature and the Extractive Industries. But first, please welcome Jenna Floyd. with an image of mining. I should actually apologise. Um, I'm in the midst of a very coldy um, episode. So um, you're going to hear a lot of sort of squeaks and brays um, coming from um, my chest. So um, apologies for that. I'm starting with an image of mining, a photograph of miners. And as you see, the plate, the photographic plate's been entitled for us by a photographer overcome by gas the resuscitation, um, and by the way, yes, um, that is incorrect. So it's part of a series of three. Um, the first shows the guys going down the shaft, um, and then there's a rescue one, and then here we have the resuscitation. The photo was taken in the Yukon, 1899, by a firm, um, a little company, quite a successful one, in Dawson, the central um, uh, city um, of, the, of the mining fields in this area. Um, and it was collected, this photograph was collected by a man, William Meads, who gathered a range of memorabilia of the stampede to the Klondike, um, a stampede that began in 1897 and lasted about two years before big corporations took over. <coughs> and this is how Mr. Meads labels this in his journal. He says, overcome by gas and resuscitation. Some of the underground working contained frozen remains of vegetation. When thawed, this emitted a noxious gas, and treatment was necessary for one so affected. The long hair and beard of one of the men is an example of the custom of some desiring to be distinguished as Sardos, old timers from Chichacos, newcomers. Mm. Might have known, you might have known such, such um, information from popular writing, from newspapers, lots of this stuff about old hands in the Klondike and new people who are sort of muscling in, um, in popular writing of the day. Not a lot seems to be going on in this area. It seems as if they're hardly making any impact on the landscape at all. There's a few bits of equipment, see a pickaxe. It's all a bit of a model. Still, Meads keep to record his knowledge, passing on stuff that he knows about dangers, customs, names. But I'm not quite sure why he wants to tell us about their hair. So <laughs> where are we exactly? Well, I can show you um, a couple of maps. You can see this region, mining region, spread across the Canadian Yukon and then the American Alaska, or from Russia in 1867. I quite like the way that it's difficult to show this place, this region. Often in maps, the region that was at the focal, uh, the focus of activity has to be shown as here in its own sort of special little map. It's often bits off, um, <coughs> off side that have to be integrated um, into the map. Or, or the map is shown just in relation to um, a city that people will know, um, San Francisco, um, in this case. My first instinct on reading about this, and the instinct of many who went there at the end of the 19th century, was to think that this place was on some kind of edge, a bit that you can't get to on the map. It has to have its own insert. Certainly the northwest extremity of the North American continent although occupied, of course, by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. 
But as I say, once we look at the picture again, we could be anywhere. We could be in the States, could we, I wonder, even be in Russia, Siberia. These people seem completely isolated in this remote place. Let's start with this, really, because it speaks to something very interesting to me about the gold and silver rushes, these movements of people that started in the mid-19th century with the gold rush and had more or less reached its end by the century's turn. These people, rushing from place to place, produced a new geography of their own, linking North America, Siberia, Latin America, Southern Africa, Australia, West Africa. These places may have been remote in one sense, but they were far from obscure. Places where gold and silver were found attracted massive attention internationally, attracted money, machines, people with all kinds of agendas, <laughs> supplies from side to side, and all these were moving in a quite unpredictable way. No one can plan a mine, no one can invent a mine. Historians have often talked about mines as the shock troops of imperialism, the outward drive by aggressive powers for precious metals, first of all near the centre of power, then further and further away as those first places get exhausted. This drive has characterised world would-be emperors from ancient times. The American historian of the West, Elliot West, has talked about how a mine is like an artillery shell lobbed into the outback. Its concussion, he said, spreads outward and rolls over native peoples who will never see a sluice or a mine. We have a long-standing European tradition of thinking that a mine is always a catastrophe, socially, psychologically, and environmentally. But these rushes weren't only destructive. They engaged hundreds of thousands of people in erratic movements at their own direction, going from place to place in pursuit of wealth. Strangers were tossed together face to face, thought to thought. Populations are displaced, disrupted, temporarily or irrevocably changed. Mines caused places to be populated within weeks and then depopulated again within weeks. Cities were thrown up, instant cities, and then abandoned. Rivers blocked, forests cut down. Huge energies are released in all this impulsive, chancy movement, searching, contact, destruction. And terrific imaginative energy is part of the whole phenomenon. Desires and hopes on the part of the gold rushes, speculations on everyone's part, whether they're there or not, the effort on the part of readers, would-be miners, investors, to imagine what the diggings in these places, the mines were really like. The work of portraying mines, mining miners, to readers, investors. In at least one famous case, a whole local newspaper was written and printed, published, to describe a mine that didn't actually exist in order to raise money. Quite a lot of imaginative energy. I began my studies with a book written by a writer in Leadville, Colorado, Mary Halleck Foote. And she developed a portrait of Leadville, silver boom town, as um, a kind of Arthurian romance, you know, King Arthur, to try to evoke the bright hopes of people who went there and then their subsequent corruption the deep disillusionment setting in. The way that the place of dreams, Camelot or gold mine, something real in your dreams, but always a hopeless fantasy. As Arthur and his knights are always trying to beat back the forces of savagery, so the miners are surrounded, violence soaks the mining industry. In lots of 19th century mining stories, Treasure Island, perhaps, is one that lots of people will know of. The whole business of gold mining is telescoped into conflict, competition, warring factions. <coughs> well, all very lovely and imaginative, you may be thinking, but we're looking at an accident here, <coughs> overcome by mass, by gas. The way that mining worked here was pretty low tech, as you can see, but it wasn't any safer by that token. During the winter in the Klondike, you dug down several feet through the permafrost until you got to gravel, which was the gold-bearing layer, which you excavated. Then you waited till spring, 
when the gravel unfroze and then you sorted through to find what flakes of gold you could. So this guy has gone down and encountered poisonous gases released from defrosting or frozen vegetation. He's passed out, his blood is polluted by gas, so his mates face the challenge of bringing him round. There's no final image in the series to show him recovered. It's been argued that mining accidents, of all the work accidents of which we are aware or dimly aware, are the ones that are most present in the public mind. Indifferent as we are to so many conditions in our <coughs> workplaces, these places, mines, have a special terror. The terror of people trapped underground, even buried alive. In, in mining accidents, we're faced with a terrible proof of the greed of owners who've cut costs, not constructing mines carefully, too speculatory, too um, concerned with profit margins um, and the price paid by workers. As I wrote about this photo over several months, a year or so ago, I recorded the major accidents that were reported internationally. 38 miners drowned in a mine in Huajiangying in northern China that was still being built. 25 miners killed in an explosion in Upper Big Branch Mine in Western Virginia. 46 men in an explosion in Pinningshan City in Henan Province, China. And then the 33 miners, bet lots of people remember this, trapped in the San Jose Mine in northern Chile for nearly two months. These were only the most dramatic accidents. As for the rest, we can only imagine. Mines are hard places, disturbing places to contemplate. Here's Langston Hughes. The American poet, writing on mining and accidents in 1928, having encountered the industrial complex of mining in Johannesburg, in which Africans performed the most dangerous tasks, Johannesburg mines. In the Johannesburg mines, there are 240,000 natives working. What kind of poem would you make out of that? Mining is a disaster for humans. Can it even be the subject? of literary, my, my literary writing. Isn't it a sort of cheap self-indulgence for writers, never mind academics, to make miners mining the object of intellectual and creative expression? Documentary activism, reform activity, OK. Poetry, no, unless it focuses on disaster, accident, carnage. Which brings us back to our photo again, because this is the work of the miners themselves. Miners are not only written they have themselves developed a rich international tradition of work law. Stories, poems, jokes, songs, anecdotes, superstitions, all crammed with material about an underground world full of signs and noises, portents. Any descent underground is always stiff with mythological tradition, Persephone, Orpheus, visions of hell. But miners have their own beliefs and rituals around a movement that always threatens death, is death by. So here we have four men, Clark Kinsey, whom of course we can't see, who took the picture. He'd gone to the Klondike to try a bit of mining, but also to try to set up a photography business. There are massive opportunities for photographers in the Klondike. As people made the gruelling journey to the digging, which took many months, they were pleased to buy photographic postcards of the experience. Photographers all around uh, in, in uh, passes, such as this famous one, the Chilcot Pass. This is a vision of the struggle of getting to the mines that they could give to relatives. We could speculate that our photograph might be part of that type of image. Actually, the guy on the right of the photo squatting is Clarence Kinsey his brother's assistant, but someone who became more and more involved in his own mining chains. And then there's the man who's had the accident in the middle of bending over having his stomach squeezed. That's Asa Thurston Hayden. He mined and also drew delicate etchings of the stony landscape with little verses about the fishing, <coughs> shooting, that he sold to local newspapers. These guys did not wait for outsiders, journalists, whoever, to undertake the task of representing their experience. They developed a literature, a visual record of their own, a profusion of cultural projects. And here, in fact, they are simulating, staging an accident. 
So what was the audience for this? Well, lots of photos of the Klondike show manly challenges. The ultimate test of masculine grit, determination, go for it no matter what it costs. So is this part of that trope? Is this part of what it means, a kind of another sort of rite of passage, an accident? Or is it a kind of prank representing the worst, the least appealing reality of the diggings? Representing accident was always extremely unpopular locally, with local businesses, never mind mining businesses. So Virginia City, for example, very different scene, <coughs> deep shaft, hard, hard rock, silver mining. Journalists paid pranks on their readers to see how close they could get to the reality of human carnage going on in the Nevada mines without actually mentioning the fact. So this is Dan DeKeel here, journalist. And the Hale and Norcross mines in Virginia City were scaldingly hot. People could only work down there for about an hour at a time because of the temperatures. And at one point it flooded, um, the, the mines flooded with scalding water. And people were brought up very quickly and dunked into cold water with quite disastrous um, effects on their health. And so what the Gil does, jaunting um, uh, uh, the managers, he writes a, a story called Eyeless Fish That Live in Hot Water about fish brought to the surface and dumped in cool water and dying almost immediately. Even as indirect a reference to flooding, and indeed the lethal effect of the mine caused management rage. He didn't, of course, go any further himself. He had shares in the mine himself. So, is this photo just a wind-up too, in the same mode? Or is it a way of dominating danger by making it the object of a performance? If you look at the output of mining writers in the Klondike newspapers during the stampede, you can find stacks of songs and poems imagining the voice of dying miners, ordinary blokes in a fix, in a situation that didn't work out, addressing disappointed hopes, perhaps even overcome by gas. We have a sentiment something like this. A Dawson City mining man lay dying on the ice. He didn't have a woman nurse, he didn't have the price. But a comrade knelt beside him as the sun sat in repose to listen to his dying words and watch him while he froze. The dying man propped up his head above four rods of snow and said, I never saw it before at 98 below. Said, home this little pinhead nugget that I swiped from Jason Dills to my home, you know, a deadwood, a deadwood in the hills. Tell my friends and enemies if you ever reach the east, this Dawson City region is no place for man or beast. That the land is too elevated, the wind too awful cold, the hills of South Dakota yield as good a grade of gold. Tell my sweetheart not to worry with a sorrow too intense, for it would not thus have panned out had I had a liquor sense. <laughs> Tell the fellows in the homeland to remain and have a cinch, that the price of paint and pork chops here is 80 cents an inch, that I speak as one who's been here scratching round to find the gold, and at 10% of discount I could not buy up a cold. Now so long, he faintly whispered, I have told you what to do, and he closed his weary eyelids and for a solid PDQ. One mining historian then, to conclude, has called mining fabulously complex. I think of it as a challenge to understanding and summary, a dynamic, volatile scene that generates and inspires a broad range of imaginative responses. Mining has always forced humans to imagine new dimensions of experience. In the late 19th century, the strikes and rushes, the movement of money and things, the mines, the camps, the boom towns, the silver and gold itself demanded attention. The fate of any and all of these was difficult to grasp. But fabulous, the stuff of stories, it certainly was. Uh, 
mining was also an incredibly imaginative space. And I want to argue here that that imaginative space also led to kind of potentials for change and for challenging that danger um, as time went on. Uh, many of you may uh, recognise some of the pictures on the screen. Uh, and you'll possibly have read about the mining disaster in Turkey this summer, the worst in the country's history. On the 13th of May, just five months ago, faulty electrical equipment <coughs> sparked an explosion in a colliery just outside Soma. 301 people died, most of them from carbon monoxide poisoning. The disaster sparked riots across the country, not helped by images such as this one on the top left of a Prime Minister's aide kicking a protester. Turkey, and its collieries in particular, has long been notorious for its <coughs> safety record. A 2008 report found that Turkey had the highest death rate per million tonnes of coal mines in the world. Um, and since 2002, the country has seen about 1,500 deaths in mines. There were also accusations of cronyism, that the local government, of which the mine owner's wife was a councillor, had failed to enforce safety regulations. <coughs> Eight company employees are currently charged with manslaughter. But perhaps shocking, most shocking of all was the response of the Turkish Prime Minister, Erdogan, to the explosion. Dismissing calls for an inquiry into safety and labour conditions in the mine, the Prime Minister drew parallels with 19th century Britain in an analogy that made headlines across the world. Let me go back to the past in England, he said. In a slide in 1862, 204 people died. In 1866, 361 people died. And in an explosion in England in 1894, 290 people died. So let's please not say that these things never happen elsewhere in coal mines. These things happen. We do have something called an accident at work. Now, Erdogan's attempt to compare working conditions in modern-day Turkey uh, with those in England in the 19th century is inherently flawed, to say the least. Um, but perhaps even more troubling is his acceptance of injury and fatality of the industrial accident itself as inescapable. As Erdogan said in the same speech, this is what happens in coal mining. There is no such thing as accident-free work. <coughs> the question I want to raise in this paper is what is mining accident, and how is it explored in fiction? The National Association of Electrical Engineers in Turkey said the disaster represented murder, not an accident. And these two terms, though on the face of it diametrically opposed, have in fact long been intertwined. While Robert Castell describes accident as the eruption of the unpredictable, upon closer inspection, the term is significantly more liable to ambiguity. Accident signifies an event that is at once unforeseen and yet somehow anticipated, at once the result of human agency, <coughs> and yet also outside of human <coughs> control. Are oh, you alright? And with the idea that one can predict accident, even if re retrospectively, comes the corresponding possibility that one ought to be able to prevent it, or at least to take precautions against it. Although to many the, uh, of us here, the possibility of culpability in industrial accident may seem self-evident, it was the 19th century that really saw the development of this idea, and in particular, in many ways, the 19th century coal mine. Isolated examples of employers recognising their culpability for workplace accidents can be traced back to the Middle Ages, but only in the 19th century was the idea of employer responsibility really broached. 1836 saw the first recorded high court case of an employee suing his employer for injuries sustained at work. By 1897, just 60 years later, the Workmen's Compensation Act gave large groups of injured employees the statutory right of compensation, regardless of the fault of employers and even of their own responsibility. And mining was at the forefront of this change. Collieries were dangerous, unpredictable, cataclysmic spaces. Their accidents were unexpected, impressive, and often inescapable, particularly those in Britain. The deaths of hundreds here left very little room for individual blame. And nowhere was this point made more obvious than in the literature of the period, which really brought to life this underground world and its dangers. 
In this talk, I want to focus on the writings of Henry Morley and Dickens in Household Words in order to examine what changed in Victorian cultural attitudes in Britain to make accident in the mines, those high death rates listed by Erdogan, if not cease themselves, then at least cease to be considered acceptable. But why use Household Words, the weekly periodical edited by Dickens, for this talk? Well, firstly, because its criticism of mining accidents and disasters is unusually focused. We're used to thinking of Dickens as a novelist. He was also, as you may know, a passionate social reformer. Less well known, however, is his extended engagement with mining reform, and particularly with the 1842 first report of the Children's Employment Commission. And this was the hugely influential report that would lead to the banning of women and children from the mines. It depicted an underground world where children entered the mines around the age of six, although in some places, such as Cornwall, they began work as soon as they could crawl. And the work they did was dark, dirty and dangerous. Younger children were often trapper boys, waiting hours in the dark to open doors for the horses to pass through. Alternatively, they might be employed pushing heavy carriages of coal. And here are the, some of the famous illustrations that are still used today as an example of poor uh, labour conditions in the Victorian period. <coughs> Along with much of the population, Dickens was outraged by the report's findings. He could not, he wrote, keep from cursing the present system and its fatal effects in keeping down thousands and thousands of God's images with all my heart and soul. But more than this, he acted on his outrage. He went down mines alongside Rocky Collins, most famously to the Bottleneck Mine in Cornwall. That's that there. He wrote to and supported parliamentary campaigners. And in household words and elsewhere, he both commissioned and wrote impassioned articles in favour of reform. I also want to look at household words because these articles, read by families across Britain, give us an insight into the way perceptions of mining accident were changing <coughs> in literature, often in, in advance of legislation. Take Henry Morley's famous denunciation of the dangerous nature of industrial workplaces in preventable accidents, commissioned by Dickens in 1854. In a striking use of rhetoric, Morley begins the article by assuming the voice of various victims of industrial accidents. So he says, I am, if you please, a bricklayer, and was at work the other day on the foundations of a house lately pulled down. Next door tumbled over me, and I was drawn half dead out of the ruins. I am, if you please, a little boy, and was at play the other day among the bricks of a house that had been sold as it stood for building materials <coughs> in lots. Lots at the top and lots at the bottom were being pulled out and carted away indiscriminately. The whole building, therefore, in one lot, to save trouble, came down at once over me, and I was maimed for life before I had grown old enough to do a stroke of business. I am, if you please, a miner, and was at work the other day in a colliery shaft famous for a great, great explosion, which had destroyed 50 or 60 men not months before. There was a fresh explosion, and 120 more were killed. I only had my skin burnt off and my leg broken. In this uh, article, the disparate industrial accidents combined to become far more than the sum of their parts. <coughs> the connection between apparently unpredictable accidents are made glaringly and awfully apparent. I am, this narrator concludes, the victim of accident, and what accident may be is what I wish to know. So what for Morley is accident? The answer is clear. It seems to me that nine accidental deaths out of a dozen arise from culpable carelessness and negligence. And the solution? In a word, Morley writes, the law must, sooner or later, in all such instances, make mischance almost as heavy as a crime. Although the article uh, begins with a list of victims, these voices are counterpointed with a final section representing the voices of those either responsible for or complicit in <coughs> marginalising the victims of accidents. Among these latter voices is a surgeon in a mining district, modelled possibly on Morley himself, but without doubt on his experiences of the profession. A medical graduate from uh, King's College London uh, Morley has spent four years as a doctor uh, working for colliers and their families before becoming a journalist. It becomes quickly clear, however, that the mind surgeon is a fallible narrator. Um, so, oh, sorry, gone forward. Stuffy words. Um, so he says, I am a surgeon in a mining district and take leave to describe <coughs> that mining accidents are accidents 
and there is the end of the whole matter. So we leave us some more of the uh, articles he wrote on mining. There is no more to be said. There must always be such. They are a natural and essential part of my practice. I have a man or two killed, I suppose, once a fortnight. Sometimes, instead of one or two, they are killed half a dozen at a time, and there is a slight, a very slight, sensation in the parish. Such accidents rarely appear in country papers, and of course they are not worth sending up to London. They belong to mining life, and I don't believe that you could ever get exact numbers of the numbers of lives lost annually in our mines and coal mines. As a surgeon, Morley saw the fallacy of the sensing accidents inevitable, but as only as a journalist, as a writer, he is able to challenge its foundations rather than patch up its results. So a prolific writer in household words and articles such as these, Morley was able to not only predict the major pit collapses and accidents um, that grabbed the popular imagination, but also the daily accidents that made life in the mine so dangerous. It is thought that 80% of fatal collie accidents were the result of individual accidents, resulting in, uh, to use a memorable phrase, a steady drip drip of death that never rated more than a brief mention in the local paper. By writing about these deaths, by making them real to his readers' imaginations, Morley shows that the near misses, the minor accidents, and the individual fatalities of mining accident all contributed to a systematic acceptance of injury and fatality. Being published in 1854, two numbers before the beginning of hard times, Morley's preventable accidents allows us to read Stephen Blackpool's death in an interestingly new light. I'm sure that for many of you, hard times will be forever remembered for its town of red brick, its machinery and tall chimneys. But interestingly, the climax of Dickens' novel does not take place in the city at all, but instead occurs when Dickens' working class protagonist, Stephen, is badly injured and dying in an abandoned coal shaft. An apparently peaceful uh, rural setting located several miles outside the city, the green landscape plotted here and there with heaps of coal uh, is littered with indicators of the previous <coughs> part of the mining industry. So why does Dickens do this? Why does he shift his narrative? I want to argue that it's something to do with the symbolic power of the pit shaft itself. The pit shaft, whether abandoned or working, <coughs> is a recurring object Fear. Morley's 1850 short story, The King of the Heart, describes a collier falling down a shaft. In language very similar to Hard Times, not that I'm accusing Dickens of copying anyone, of course, um, <laughs> the miner lies at the bottom of the shaft and muses on the single star he can see above him. Dickens' 1854 <coughs> article, uh, Fire and Snow, also describes the noise of fear being swallowed by a long abandoned, long forgotten shaft in this undermined country. Both stories really play on the fact that mine shafts cannot be seen until up close. Uh, Collie owners, having extracted their profit in the form of coal, frequently abandoned the pits with little, if any, attempts at making them safe. This was the unseen cost of mining the coal that provided Coke Town with industry, prosperity, and even its name. As with Morley's depiction of parental accidents then, Stephen's death into an uncovered pit shaft and his subsequent um, death is not an isolated, inexplicable, or unchanging incident. I want to return really quickly here to that 1842 first report of the Children's Employment Commission again. Because by choosing Stephen's unglamorous death in the old hell shaft as a great effect, Dickens was in fact referencing a heated debate over the lack of <coughs> shaft fencing. Um, a detailed analysis in the first report placed, uh, placed falling down pit shafts as the third most common method of death in the mines. Um, so it had lots of pictures, lots of analysis. Uh, despite being less spectacular and more preventable, the report noted that the number of deaths from the unguarded state of the pit's mouth exceeds the whole of those which happen from the explosive and suffocating gases. The report here challenges our idea of mining deaths as spectacularly and, sh uh, spectacular and shocking. It shows that they were in fact often mundane and all too avoidable. And in doing so, it challenges the fallacy of mining and of industrial accidents more generally. As the first report noted, the high number of deaths in pit shafts was not <coughs> surprising, but rather a result which no one can regard as extraordinary, who has considered all the evidence relating to the unguarded state of the mass of the pits. In Stephen's death, then, murder and accident become in inseparable. Stephen's impending death is first signaled by Dickens in the discovery of his hat lying abandoned on the moor. <coughs> Sissy's shocked response flies to the tropes of sensationalism. She says, he has been made away with. 
his life murdered here. The irony is palpable. As with the colliers depicted in parental accidents, Dickens shows that Stephen has instead been subject to another kind of industrial murder, masquerading under the erroneous label of accident. I'm going to leave you with Stephen's death. <coughs> and as I read it, I'd like you to notice how Stephen's syntax noticeably slips in this vital packet passage uh, from the first person singular to the plural, from I to we. The victim of the mining accident in Dickens' work is no longer an isolated individual. Rather, the frequency and severity of such supposedly unpredictable events in the colliers clearly demonstrated that an acceptable rate of injury had been built into the system. So Dickens writes, I'm not going to try and do the accent, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I have fell into the pit, my dear, as have cost within the knowledge of old folk now living hundreds and hundreds of men's lives, fathers, sons, brothers, dear to thousands and thousands, in keeping them from wants and hunger. I have fell into a pit that have been with their fire damp crueler than battle. I have read on it in the public petition, as anyone may read, from the men that works in the pits, in which they have prayed and prayed the lawmakers for Christ's sake not to let their work be murder to them, but to spare them for the wives and children that they love as well as gentlefolk loves theirs. When it were in work, it killed without need. Uh, when it is let alone, it kills without need. See how we die in no need, one way and another, in a muddle, every day. I've looked at household words in this talk, and in particular writings by Henry Morley and Dickens, but the implications do stretch further. In another talk, I'd like to explore the history of mining legislation, more detailed statistics, and the heat of parliamentary debates of time. But here I really want to look at the changing cultural mindsets about accident in the 19th century, as Britain expanded to become a global industrial power. Publications such as Household Words brought the unseen implications of mining accident into the domestic sphere itself, subverting the narrative trope of fireplaces as uh, places for storytelling, for warmth, for a cosy ignoring of the world outside. And this message is, as Jenna points out, still relevant today, for mining accident did not go away <coughs> in the 19th century. In Britain, we only need to think of Bresford, of Aberfan, of the deaths of four miners in Wales in 2011, for which the mine manager and owners have recently been found not guilty of manslaughter. And, again, as the British coal industry has declined, increasingly the dangers of mining have been transferred overseas countries with cheaper labour and less regulation. Um, the figures involved truly really are kind of shocking. Um, it has been estimated that since the turn of the 20th century in South Africa, over 60,000 miners have died, and more than a million have been seriously injured in mining accidents. As Morley warns his reader in the collier at home, we shall soon be shuddering to look at the coal within our grates when it burns blood red. ghosts and gemstones, and I thought there might be a forest here. I don't know if that's an apology. Um, anyway, that's the way it is. Um, I'm going to actually be returning to a question that Janet raised, which was about whether or not um, mining is something that um, can, it can be the subject of literature, and obviously I agree with Janet. Um, but for a moment, I'm going to think about a debate in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, um, uh, as it crossed kind of literary and scientific texts about that very question. So um, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to start with John Aiken um, and his essay on the application of natural history to poetry. This was a really influential essay written in 1777 where he argued that natural history should give poets um, kind of greater uh, vehicles for their poetry and subject matter. But he said... Every part of natural history does not seem equally capable of affording poetical imagery. The vegetable creation, delightful as it is to the senses and extensive in utility, yields comparatively few materials to the poet, whose art is principally defective in representing those qualities in which it chiefly excels, colour, scent and taste. The mineral kingdom is still more sterile, that's his spelling, and unaccommodated to description. 
So he says zoology is uh, the, the subject of his book, really. So the mineral kingdom became this kind of known as the, um, the thing that you couldn't describe in poetry, the kind of end point of poetic um, ability. And I'm going to think about some ways in which that was taken up by a wide variety of writers. I'm going to actually skip to the end uh, of my chronology here, though, so 1830 to 33, and um, hopefully this talk is going to connect that 1833 moment back with 1777, and introduce you, um, I'm sure some of you have already heard of him, to Charles Lyell and his principles of geology. Charles Lyell was actually a, um, a lecturer in geology at King's for a little while, but he's better known for this work, The Principles of Geology, an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. This is the most important geological book of the 19th century. It's the one that's always cited as being a really important influence on Charles Darwin, and it was widely read both by men of science, men and women of science, and also um, much more widely than that, and it's referenced in novels and as far afield as you can imagine. So this attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surfaces, of the Earth's surface, there's only one, um, by reference to causes now in operation, you can just about make that out there, I think, um, often means that um, Lyle was considered to be writing about gradual change in the history of the Earth. That if you gave the Earth a long enough span of time, if you imagined that it was old enough, um, then even the tiniest thing, like the dripping of water, could create continents in the end. And he asked his readers to, who already, many of them, uh, believed in the immensity of, the, of deep time, um, to, to kind of expand their imaginations, to think about the power of tiny things to affect great change over a long amount of time. And that's one of the reasons it was important for Charles Darwin. Um, but... Uh, Really, he's not writing a kind of history of the Earth as a theatre of gradual change. Really, he's thinking about geological method. And his problem is that um, lots of other geologists were using kind of large scale, so suggesting that um, great breaks in the strata suggested that there were, had been great catastrophes in the history of the Earth. And he said, we can't argue that because we can't see, as human observers, we can't see what happened um, thousands, even, uh, let alone millions of years ago, we are essentially kind of useless when it comes to um, analysing what's going on in the Earth. So we need to look at all the things that have happened within human history and restrict our scale of what might have happened in Earth history to what we have actually observed. Um, so that's the point about um, explaining the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. He didn't say there never had been great changes, just that we didn't have any evidence for them because as human beings we hadn't seen them. Um, he had a second problem, though, about the position of human beings as observers, and that was that they couldn't see geological processes happening. So he says, the first and greatest difficulty then consists in our habitual unconsciousness that our position as observers is essentially unfavourable when we endeavour to estimate the magnitude of the changes now in progress. In consequence of our inattention to the subject, we are liable to the greatest mistakes in contrasting the present with former states of the globe. We inhabit about a fourth part of the surface, and that portion is almost exclusively the theatre of decay and not of reproduction. So, of course, it's like erosion rather than the creation of continents. We know, indeed, that new deposits are annually formed in seas and lakes, and that every year some new igneous rocks are produced in the bowels of the earth. But we cannot watch the progress of the, their formation. And as they're only present to our minds by the aid of reflection, it requires an effort, both of the reason and the imagination, to appreciate duly their importance. Lyle's solution to this problem, the problem of where to, what to do with the imagination and how to imagine what was going on beneath the earth in places that you can't see, uh, was to Alexander <coughs> So he said, if we may be allowed, he, first of all, he said, perhaps we should imagine ourselves to be amphibious beings who can see things going on both above ground and in water. But that won't work, because then we, won't, we still won't be able to see what's going on underground. So if we may be allowed so far to indulge the imagination as to suppose a being entirely confined to the netherworld, some dusky melancholy sprite like Umbriel, who could flit on sooty pinions to the central earth, but was never permitted to sully the fair face of light and emerge into the regions of water and of air. <coughs> and if this 
being should busy himself in investigating the structure of the globe, he might frame theories the exact converse of those usually adopted <coughs> by human philosophers. And he goes on to outline some of those, how, how human philosophers have argued things uh, incorrectly because of what they can't see beneath the earth and how this gnome-like figure uh, would not be able to, umbriel, would, not, would, would reason the opposite if he couldn't leave um, the bowels of the earth, as he calls them. So umbriel... Um, is from Pope's Rape of the Lock, um, a 1714 poem. This is the quotation that, that Lyle is referring to. Um, I'm sure many of you know the poem already, but I'll briefly recant it here. It's a poem um, uh, der famously derived from a very trivial incident in which a man cut uh, a young woman's hair, a uh, lock of her hair in public, and her uh, reaction to that. The whole, two families fell out over it. And Pope wrote this mock heroic poem about the descent um, into the underworld, which is the descent into the woman's spleen, um, uh, mocking, essentially, their, their, their complaint with one another. So the, the usual epic kind of descent into the underworld that you find in um, uh, Iliad, the Odyssey, in, in um, Milton is reconceived as a descent into the woman's spleen to find out why she's so moody, effectively. <laughs> So it's a, a mock heroic moment. Um, so Lyle's use of that thought experiment, you could just think, OK, he's just dressing up kind of his point. This is a, a thought experiment to show you how useless your imagination is. And what the gnome shows you is not, it doesn't show you anything. It just shows you what you can't see. It just shows you how ineffective your vision is. Your vision on, on, the, on the surface of the earth is as useless as the gnomes beneath the earth. And, and the slight kind of irony and comic nature of the illusion um, serves serve to reinforce the kind of um, partiality of human view. Um, but there's a long, long history of uh, writings, both scientific and literary, and many of them interrogating the relationship between science and literature. That quote, that Pope poem, um, and an attempt to write a poetry of the underground. Um, so I'm going to begin with John Sargent's The Mine in 1785. Um, this poem is not very well known, mainly because it's absolutely <coughs> terrible um, in more ways than one, and, and his reviewers um, were pretty scathing about it too. Um, uh, but what he did, what John Sargent did in this poem was he took a story that had been quite popular, it had been narrated in lots of periodicals, and it had gone on stage as the heroine of the cave, uh, uh, Drury Lane. Um, and it was a story, supposedly a true story, but there are so many versions of it, you can't tell what the true one actually might have been, um, about uh, uh, a man who wanted to marry a woman in, in Saxony, um, decided that the only way to get her away from the man that she'd married was to set up a duel between her husband and the prince, figuring the prince would either kill the, um, the, the, the husband or would not kill him but then be forced to arrest him for dueling and imprison him. And that is actually what did happen. Uh, neither of them died, but because they were dueling, um, the, the, both of them were sent into the mines at Idria, those quicksilver mines, the mercury mines. Um, and uh, the wife decided to go down with the husband. In John Sargent's version of this text, she, which is partly why it's so ridiculous, she goes into the mine with her husband, but he and she looks after him all the time because it's so terrible being in this absolutely dreadful, dark, awful space. And the footnotes, John Sargent's poem has lots of footnotes, helpfully uh, explaining the poem. Um, it's, it, in the footnotes, he says lots about how the dreadful effects of mercury poisoning on people who work down in these mines and how people were sent down as a punishment, effectively. Um, so in John Sargent's poem, she goes into the mine with her husband, but he doesn't recognise her because it's so dark and she's got a veil on, um, even though she's crying, talking to him, his best friend down there, who doesn't ever realise that it's his wife, uh, much to the fury of the reviewers <laughs> that first looked at it. Um, so John Sargent said, as the limits of pure philosophy are extended, the writer of every species of composition is entitled to avail himself of its discoveries, and by deriving new image and similitudes from them to confer on his work a greater degree of utility and embellishment. It will occur to the candid that the imagination in such cases may be indulged without deserting truth. 
and that whatever contributes to bring us acquainted with the works of nature has a tendency both to enlarge the understanding and to improve the heart. And this was a direct rebuttal of um, Aiken's suggestion that you couldn't write about the mind. He, it's almost like he's taking up the literary challenge. Okay, you said I can't write about the mind. Well, I'm going to show you. Um, and he sort of does. Um, Mining had long, uh, the mining of quicksilver had long been associated with uh, alchemy. And this is where I think this connects interestingly with, um, with Pope's poem. Pope used the kind of supernatural machinery, if you like, of gnomes, nymphs, salamanders, and I always forget the other one. Uh, gnomes, nymphs, salamanders, and something else. Uh, um, sylphs. So sylphs are the elements of the air. Nymphs or undines of the water, salamanders of fire, and gnomes of the earth. And they're associated with a long literature of, um, alch of alchemical texts. Um, uh, and Pope uses that rather kind of ironically and flippantly um, as a kind of interesting machinery for uh, directing you down into the heroine's spleen, effectively. It's a way of taking you in his poem to places that you couldn't otherwise see. Um, <coughs> The quicksilver mines at Idria were associated with alchemy too, and there's an alchemist's crucible, um, simply because quicksilver is supposedly one of the, um, it, it, it's almost acts as a philosopher's stone in alchemical literature, so you can use it to turn base metals into gold, effectively. Well, you can't really, but, but you know, you might be able to. Um, um, and so there's a weird sense in which all these texts that keep referencing Pope, even though they claim, make claims to be scientific, and even though alchemy has long since been debunked, keep um, uh, invoking the language of alchemy for strange reasons. So this is what uh, Sargent said about it. In an attempt to unite poetry and science, the author has interwoven a kind of chorus of gnomes and subterranean spirits founded like the machinery of the sylphs in the rape of the lock on the system of Rosicrucius. Uh, that's Rosicrucianism it is, is the language that um, is, is, a, is a kind of early secret society that's associated with alchemy. That inimitable poem, The Rape of the Lock, has made the system of the Rosicrucians, the system of sylphs and salamanders and all the whatnot, it is presumed familiar to everyone. So congenial is it to the human mind to associate the idea of supernatural agents with darkness and the wonders of the subterraneous world that such superstitious notions are generally found to prevail among the people who inhabit the mine countries. Um, so his technique, I think, is a technique which is about um, harnessing this language of sylphs and gnomes, not only to take you into the mind, into this place that you can't ordinarily see, um, and, and the gnomes in this poem, um, they light up. This is a ver it's supposed to be a, a kind of dramatic verse that you could potentially act it out. It would, I can't imagine it. Um, but you, um, but the, the stage direction reads that when the gnomes are on stage, it lights up, and at all other times, the stage is in darkness. And there's lots of language about how, they, um, how uh, phosphorus, for instance, which, is, which can gleam on its own, um, and bringing kind of um, uh, light. They bring light to the subterranean world. Um, so in one sense, I think, Sargent uses this Rosicrucian structure to enable you to see underground in a way that you can't, that, that Lyle says you simply can't. Um, in another, it's, it's a claim, I think, for the grandeur of the mine and the power of the mine. Um, John Sargent was actually an MP, and he was in charge of all sorts of commercial things that I don't quite understand yet. Um, but what I will say about that is that he, um, he claims that it, this is Miltonic poetry. And some of his best friends, who did a lot to vaunt this poem and to publicize it, also claimed that it was Miltonic. So the English Review said the first speech of the gnomes appears to be in Milton's best manner. And you have these things like the ribbon mountains from their base are hurled and elemental wars convulse the world, which is a reference, I think, to um, both to Pope, who has the same rhyme, hurled and whirled, and to book six of Paradise Lost. What I think is interesting about that is book six of Paradise Lost, the angels tear up the mountains. So hills amid the air encountered hills, hurled to and fro with chaculation dire, that underground they fought in dismal shade, infernal noise. So this is actually um, the fight between good and evil, if 
effectively. Um, so in some senses, the gnomes have this slightly devilish cast to them um, as they kind of convulse, as their agency um, creates the world, but also convulses the world. And what Sargent does is work very hard to downplay the kind of um, scariness of the gnomes effectively and to make them agents of change and usefulness. Um, skip over that. This is his, um, this is his friends. This is important. William Hazlitt said um, he'd already lived out, outlived one generation of favourite poets, the Darwins, the Haleys, the Seawards. Who reads them now? Well, nobody really. But who <laughs> they read um, Sargent. They were his friends. And all of these poems that I've listed here um, are paeans to the power of the mind. And they do all this kind of silly punning where they say, now the glory of the poet of the mind is mine. And all of this kind of thing. Um, and and uh, talk about how beautiful the poem is. And they also, pub they also anonymously um, uh, published reviews of his work, trying to give it some, uh, kind, of, kind of buffer it up. Um, and in lots of their reviews and in lots of their writing, they say, see, Aiken said you can't write about the mind, but you can, you can write about it. And he has, and it's beautiful. Um, so Haley, William Haley, who's most famous for writing um, the biography of, of William <coughs> Cooper, said it's the worthy writer of Milton's Comus, whilst he would said in a private letter, I do not rate its claim quite so high, but I place it on a level with, that should say Milton, with Milton's Caractacus. Why is it that people of fine understanding and general accuracy of taste are often so blind to the irradiations of genius when it's first emerging? Um, uh, it, he never wrote another poem, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> What, he, what happened with this poem, though, was it got incorporated in strange ways into a much better known poem, Erasmus Darwin's The Botanic Garden. Um, this poem was the kind of philosophical verse romance par excellence of the 1790s, also the most popular poem of the 1790s by an absolute mile, um, and very well known to the early romantic writers who first loved Darwin's dazzling poetry and then later all said it made them sick. Um, but um, Darwin's Botanic Garden is a, is a long poem in two parts, one called The Economy of Vegetation and one called The Lives of the Plants. Mostly people have focused on the lives of the plants um, because, uh, because still not many people write about mining and literature, I guess. Um, but in the front of that poem, there were all kinds of poems kind of, and, and apologies and letters to Darwin saying how fantastic he was. And one of them was this, to Dr. Darwin, while Sargent winds with fond and curious <coughs> eyes through every mazy region of the mine, while as entrancing forms around him rise with magic light the mineral kingdoms shine. Behold, amid the vegetable bloom, O oh Darwin, my ambrosial rivers flow, and suns more pure than fragrant earth loom as all the vivid plants with passion grow. Etc. So the, um, Darwin was friends, actually, with Seawood and the poets who had it, who had kind of um, publicised Sargent's poem, and now he includes a sort of advert for Sargent, uh, <coughs> and a sort of claim that he's going to do the same thing now for vegetables. And in fact, they both use the same system. So um, Sargent um, invokes Linnaeus, and so does Darwin. But Linnaeus' system of minerals was uh, not well received, even at the time, whereas his system of plant taxonomy was much more um, uh, uh, widely used. Um, so, in fact, Darwin's botanic garden, in some ways, is a trumping, an expansion and a trumping of Sargent's <coughs> poem. So, so, Darwin, his poem, let me just show you, this is uh, one page of the poem. So, uh, the top there, the first four lines, that's poetry, and then the rest is notes. And then the second column, halfway down, that's poetry, and then there's a line, and then there's notes. And that's what most of the poem looks like. It's a very long poem, and it's full of notes, and they're all scientific, and with lots of references. And this is a poem designed to um, outline the taxonomy of the uh, vegetable kingdom, um, but also in the economy of vegetation, he talks about the underground um, at particular length, because that's uh, the ground, in, the soil in which plants grow. And it's also um, the economy of vegetation is much more industrial. So he, he advertises he's friends with Josiah Wedgwood, and he uh, you can see that that's Wedgwood's um, uh, pottery. Um, his "Am I a Man and a Brother Emancipation" um, little disc. Um, so the, so he he advertises the industrial products that come from the earth. So even more than Sargent, he turns this. Um, uh, 
subterranean, unknowable space. And this is his section of the Earth, and that whole big middle bit just says unknown regions. Um, uh, he turns this unknowable space of the centre of the Earth into something that can be turned to useful and profitable account. Um, he says in the advertisement to the work, this is very famous, the general design of the following sheets is to enlist imagination under the banner of science and to lead her votaries from the looser analogies which draw out, which dress out the imagery of poetry to the stricter ones which form the ratiocination of philosophy. Um, uh, and he then, on the left, uh, references this whole Rosicrucian doctrine of knowns, uh, sylphs, nymphs, and salamanders, not giving a very useful explanation of why he's doing it. Um, but he too employs this Rosicrucian structure, he too references Pope, and the difference being, I think, that he thinks that imagination and science, that they're not um, things that should be in any kind of conflict, rather imagination is about loose philosophical thinking that might enable you to get to the stricter analogies of science. Um, and he, he uh, kind of makes good on that. He'll often put in wildly speculative theories into the footnotes and then say, I have no evidence for this, but that's okay because this is a poem, and it might lead other um, men of science to develop better theories later on. So poetry kind of has a heuristic function, I guess, to, as, a, as a vehicle of thought. The, the imaginative um, space of poetry enables him to do what he conceives of as real scientific work. This is just his bit about gnomes. Um, uh, as the gnomes kind of produce the work underground, hammering and chiseling away at the rock, so are people above ground doing it and producing beautiful things like Red Woods Etruscan Portland Vase, which he includes a picture of, just in case you want to buy it. Um, so, um, so, I just have one final very short <coughs> poem to show you that connects all this kind of poetry back to Charles Lyell. And it's a poem called King Cole's Le Vie that was published in 1818. This poem is a, a kind of history, it's a party between all the rocks, and uh, it, they're laid out in stratigraphical order, and there's lots of ridiculous puns. I've put some here. Nice was but a weather beaten man. Uh, he was indeed in decomposing state. Slate was split with his best friends upon occasion slight. And yeah, you just groan from line to line the whole way through. Um, it was just published by a Northumbrian poet in a couple of hundred copies, and then it got picked up in two different places. It got picked up at the University of Oxford by two geologists, William Buckland, also no relation, and Coney Beer. Um, <laughs> And it also got picked up by some radicals in Yorkshire and Lancashire. And they went to, the radicals went to publish it, partly because it has, I won't read it to you, but um, uh, the gnomes here don't actually help you see anything or do anything. Uh, they're just uh, sort of uh, bouncers for King Cole. And when the plebeian pebbles kind of rush on him, um, the gnomes drive them out. And then Gravel, King Gravel, comes and says, why did you drive the pebbles out of your party? And they have a kind of warning. He says, ah, oh, you're just ridiculous, Cole. You're going to be... Um, King Davy's coming with his lamp, and soon you're going to be completely mined from these rocks, and there'll be nothing left of you, so I don't care. Um, so, this a, uh, so, but this was kind of read as um, actually a, a radical allegory, and so these radical um, publishers in Yorkshire and actually wanted to publish it as, a, um, as an argument, effectively, for overthrowing the government. Um, what happened was that at the University of Oxford, Buckland and Coneybeer picked it up, and they um, added lots of notes from it, used it in their teaching to teach stratigraphy, and Charles Lyell was one of Buckland's students at this very moment. Um, and the poem was explicitly uh, a reworking of uh, Erasmus Darwin, it, it references him. Um, and then they wrote a critical dissertation on it. They said, the author of King Cole is the first who has nobly and completely rescued poetry from the manacles of meaning. Um, our author has managed to emancipate poetry from its cumbrous connection with sense, an emancipation from which we anticipate the most extraordinary <coughs> results. Such is in substance the narrative of the poem, but to what former or future revolutions of the globe, or to what facts in geology it refers, we are utterly at a loss to conjecture. And that, I think, is very important, because they want to set up the order of the strata, make the underground knowable, but not turn it into a, a big, giant story with a beginning and an ending. And that 
is exactly what Charles Lyell was doing in his Principles of Geology. He said, we can't know what the beginning of the Earth looked like. We can't know what the Earth will look like in the future. We can only reason on what we have here and now. So the, meaningless of, the meaninglessness of um, Scaife's poem um, and the pointlessness of his gnomes actually became important, not only for saying geology doesn't have a story, but also for wrestling geology away from seditious implications, seditious implications of science and the ways it could be taken up, its arguments could be taken up by radicals. Um, I don't have much of a conclusion except to say that I think the underground, because of its very inaccessibility and the way that superstitious and strange kinds of writing attached to it, um, becomes a kind of place in which the relationship, the disciplinary separation of literature and science becomes enacted because you can't see the underground without imagination and you can't imagine it properly without science. So at all points in this history, people are <coughs> wrangling and negotiating over the distinction between what literature might be and what science might be. Um, I don't think I've suggested really that mining is the subject of literature since all these poems are so dreadful. But um, <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, there we are. Thank you. First of all, can I say um, it's wonderful to be back here at King's. Uh, thank you especially to Gordon and to Ian Henderson for the invitation to, to be part of the, um, uh, the research symposiums and panels like this one that are going on over the next few days. And uh, it's a pleasure to hear my colleagues' other papers and to, uh, to perhaps try and add something from a, from a different perspective. Um, <clears throat> this paper is part of um, some work about um, the lack of critical insight or understanding um, about the role of mining in Australian literature. Um, as you as you know, <coughs> mining is very important in the history of Australian literature, um, and it's there in the literature in many ways, um, <clears throat> and in thematic ways, in formal ways, and but this has been much marked on or noticed by critics and. Uh, the larger work that I'm doing here is about, um, at the moment, is about that. It's kind of about realism in its, in its relations to national literatures and so on. But this extract that I thought might be of interest here uh, is about um, <clears throat> some aspects of representations of mining, literary representations of mining, in relation to um, uh, both, both uh, Indigenous culture in Australia, Indigenous politics, uh, and also in, in, in relation to uh, with respect of um, Aboriginal uh, contemporary Indigenous writing itself. Um, in, a 2006, in a 2006 article in the Australian newspaper which appeared under one of Tracy Moffat, <coughs> Tracy Moffat is a, a contemporary Australian Aboriginal um, artist, um, mostly photography, um, but um, other works as well, other media. Um, this um, uh, article of Marcy Langton's appeared uh, under a, um, one of Marcy Langton's photographs of Broken Hill called, in a series called Up in the Sky. And Langton began by um, recalling two events that year that had rekindled her interest in the complicated relationship ranging from the brutally and pragmatically financial to the highly emotional that Australians have had with the mining industry. For Langton, these events seem to frame, and I'm quoting you here, the, the question of how we will understand the new boom and the way mining is still changing Australia. In April, the media broadcast every detailed, oh, this is another disaster, of the Beaconsfield mine tragedy in Tasmania. This was in um, 1998. Uh, Beaconsfield is a gold mine in the northern part of Tasmania. And there was a disaster there. Uh, the Beaconsfield mine tragedy in Tasmania, from the impact of the death of Larry Knight on the community, one of the miners, to the emotion and heroism of the tense and laboriously slow 14-day rescue of Todd Russell and Brant Webb, 
two miners who survived the, the cave-in. As if I had read about them in a novel, I now have an odd imaginary relationship with a small Tasmanian mining town and the two, <coughs> uh, uh, the two fortunate men rescued from its mine. The previous month, it's March, I was struck by the death of artist and uh, sculptor Pro Hart, a miner in his youth. Hart had lived most of his life in the mining city of Broken Hill in far western New South Wales, where he painted the people and streetscapes, the landscapes and the mines, long ignored by urban and industry elites as merely a naive artist. Hart struck a chord with ordinary Australians, especially the mining folk who were his subjects. After his death, the print and broadcast media provided tributes to his life that repeatedly re uh, reminded us of the irony that the National Gallery of Australia does not own a single work by Australia's most opulent artist. Langton recalls Moffat's images of the obliquely referenced Broken Hill landscapes, no romance under the big western skies, only discontented souls, treeless gullies, the highway, storm drains and corrugated iron shanks in connection with her experience of the mediatised Beaconsfield drama and the news of Prohart's death. Her article speculates on the aesthetic and social contradictions she perceives in these two events that have their, re have their resonances in her own history of growing up as, ab as an Aboriginal person in South Queensland <coughs> and in her knowledge of the history of mining in Australia. Langton is primarily, well, she's initially an anthropologist. The brief fictocritical moments in this article that uh, that all reference mining are no doubt in response to the complexities and tensions that Langton senses. Moffat's photographs, like this one, acute studies of the edges of an imagined mining landscape and society, were in fact commissioned by New York's Dyer Art Foundation, DIA Art Foundation, and therefore circulate within a global contemporary art world which includes the internationally oriented Roslyn Oxley Nine Gallery in Sydney, where the series was first exhibited. So they circulate within a, um, uh, a, if you like, an elite postmodern um, artistic stratosphere. The Up in the Sky series is highly elusive and technically innovative photographic work, including the image that, and I should say that Tracy Moffat lives in New York as well. Up in the Sky is a series of highly elusive and technically innovative photographic work, including the image <coughs> that heads the Australian article of a beefed up Amazonian chick swinging a mallet on top of a burnt out car. While overall, the impact of Moffat's series for Langton is apocalyptic and banal, recalling the dystopian landscapes of the Mad Max movies, I make that point because this is the, um, this is the landscape where some of the Mad Max movies famously were, were made. She also recognises the mise-en-scene as undeniably Australian. The desiccated inland, hinting at history and the new global citizens of a resource industries driven economy. All the same, as Langton recognises Moffat's work is as distinct as possible on the spectrum of Australia, is as distant as possible on the spectrum of Australian cultural expression from the work of the non-urban and naive pro art. Pro art, however, pro art, however, uh, <clears throat> much though they both may reference the landscape of Broken Hill, uh, Langton had also played a leading role in Moffat's rural tragedy. Night Cries, a short <coughs> film that's like Up in the Sky, is in dialogue with international media history and avant-garde image making. So Langton clearly feels implicated in the urban art industry elites that spurned pro Hart, just as she feels the experience of the Beaconsfield miners uh, as miners is alien. Prompted by such contemporary dualities, Langton ranges widely across Australian literature, historiography, film and art, from Fred Williams's Consing Rio Tinto Commission, Pilbara Paintings, Western and Western Cape York Landscapes, <coughs> to Geoffrey Blaney's History of the Gold, Gold Rushes and S.T. Gill's uh, Visual Chronicle of that colonial history, to little known literary works like Walter Mill's Bradshaw's poems about the 1901 South Mine tragedy in Broken Hill, to Randolph Stowe's novel of survivors in a mining ghost town, Tourmaline, in, in my state, in Western Australia, to Colin Thiel's The Fire and the Sto Stone about opal mining, to the East Kimberley artists Lena Nyadby and Paddy Bedford's prints at the Musée de Quai um, Branly in Paris at the moment of the Argyle mine country. 
um, which were opened um, in Paris in 2006. <coughs> It is the contradictory and heterogeneous status of these very different cultural expressions of mining that intrigues Langton. Even though the wealth generated by mining and the death too often involved, in, as we've heard, in earning it, has always happened a long way from, from most Australians. Uh, a rich vein of our artistic and literary heritage consists of a search for beauty and meaning amid the ruins of the industry. And a great deal of it eschews academicism, she writes, in favour of the Australian need for authenticity. Mining may provide financial subsidies for landscape and, and indigenous and non-indigenous art and material for, for nationalising sagas of frontier and settlement, but it never seems to attract the serious critique of a cosmopolitan <coughs> cultural studies. <coughs> Langton's felt dis, uh, dualities then include the tension between Aboriginal uh, biogeography, which has its economic realities in the resources industries, and a discourse of culture that sublimates these economic realities into anti or non mining paradigms of white wilderness and indigenous spiritual iconography. At the same time, Langton is, Langton is well aware of mining's role in the despoliation of Aboriginal land and society. <coughs> Mining is always a, is a catastrophe in that sense. It's quite right, the same is true in Australia. Having spent much of her childhood, as she says, in a town like Tourmaline, Randolph Stowe's Tourmaline, where I learned the Australian history I later unlearned at university. She recalls at one point in her, her essay, the first, uh, the first sentence of Stowe's novel with its reference to a bitter heritage. The specific resonance of Stowe's novel obviously has for her has for her is reflected in her perspective on settlement history. Mostly small outback towns are Aboriginal communities left behind as generation after generation from the old white families moved to the cities. The demographic of the remote inland is becoming a majority Aboriginal world broken up by islands of mine workers and a few service towns, as well as this archeological evidence of, <coughs> of the lust for mineral wealth Langton recognises the profound social ec and economic changes that contemporary mining is having on Australian life and landscape as the hyper-technological world of modern mining sweeps aside the world portrayed in pro Art, Russell Drysdale, in Janet Turner Hospital, Nyadby, Bedford and so many other brighter or dimmer, lu dimmer luminaries in our cultural heritage, she writes. Whereas the front bar of the pub in these towns was once full of droll, tough, almost feral white men in battered rabbit felt hats, there are now mostly Aboriginal people. The white men have retreated to their clubs and bars, many located on mine sites, which use membership regulations to exclude locals. There are no tick-ridden, comatose dogs lying on the door of these establishments. These men are richer than their fathers. They work generous two weeks on, two weeks off shifts. They might have mining engineering degrees or own subcontracting companies that bid for multi-million dollar earth-moving contracts. Slowly, some thousand Aboriginal people have entered these ranks and are qualified, well-paid, and in high demand. <coughs> there are more than 100 modern impact benefit agreements negotiated by mining companies and Aboriginal groups. The old certainties of the anti-mining protest movements no longer exist. There is a significant literature from the social and political sciences on these matters, and yet the cultural workers in literature, art and film have largely, have largely not kept up with them. The environmental movement has a great deal to do with them turning their backs on these traditions, and so too does the power of Aboriginal art. It dominates all else that purports to speak for the heart of our land. <clears throat> the modernist period into which Hart, Drysdale and Williams were born is a fading memory and rapidly becoming an interesting historical period only. So you can see here some of the tensions that I'm trying to get at that within the, the discourses by Aboriginal intellectuals themselves, uh, there are tensions about the effects of Aboriginal art and its reception, um, the environmental movement and so on. Langton is also deeply knowledgeable about the resource economy in relation to the Aboriginal population and its communities and estates. Her 2008 article <coughs> Her 2008 article 
with Odette Maisel, poverty in the midst of plenty Aboriginal people, the resource curse and Australia's mining boom, explores the lack of socioeconomic improvement uh, that the mining boom, including Indigenous land use agreements, has meant for Aboriginal communities. Since then, Langton has publicly and controversially argued her support for the mining industry and its potential to benefit remote Aboriginal communities. Firstly, in her 2012 Boyer Lectures for ABC Radio, The Quiet Revolution, Indigenous People in the Resources Boom, and subsequently in the 2013 SBS documentary, Dirty <coughs> Business, How Mining Made Australia, in three episodes, Money, Power, Land. In the heart of the country, for Langton, there coexist the ruins of a settler development history and its heterogeneous aesthetic modes, <coughs> and a powerful contemporary economic and cultural re reality of incommensurate ideologies and knowledges. The participant and occasionally fictor critical anthropology of Langton's writing on Aboriginal knowledge and belief systems and the social and spiritual relations of Aboriginal people to country and landscape exists alongside, for example, anthropologists like David Trigger's ethnographic, ethnographic studies, very interesting these, of narratives of development and progress as they constitute the life worlds of white mining engineers. Those who drive the resource development industries are understood as pursuing, pursuing the tasks of mineral exploration and development with a surety about the cultural and moral significance as well as its economic importance to Australian culture. And that interesting ethnographic work by Trigger, who is also a, um, uh, mostly um, an eth ethnographer of uh, Aboriginal land title and um, society uh, is about how mining engineers often feel, feel a deep personal subjective sense of doing the work of nation building. The discovering discovering a, a mineral load uh, is, is akin to um, a nation building um, contribution. These studies, one by an indigenous public intellectual and policy leader, one by an anthropologist with long experience in native title negotiations, point to the impact of the multiple and conflicting realities of the resource <coughs> industries at the discursive core of national ideology, but also to the strange convergence of, the, of these realities. Mining in contemporary and heritage modes continues, continues to inflect social reality as it appears in narratives of both country and nation. Well, as it happens, in <coughs> excuse me, as it happens, later in 2006, Alexis Wright's Carpenteria was published, and had she been able to read um, read it for her article, Langton would instantly have rec recognised the important role that mining plays in the novel, just as it does in the history and contemporary life of the Gulf the Gulf country uh, where the novel is set. Indeed, Wright's novel provides a further complex. Alexis Wright is an um, Aboriginal Australian writer whose ancestry is in the Wanyi, um, Wanyi um, <clears throat> people's area in, in the Gulf Country, Gulf Country. If, if Langton had been able to read this novel, Langton. Uh, she, w she would have instantly have recognised the important role that mining plays in the novel, just as it does in the history and contemporary life of the Gulf, Gulf country where the novel is set. Indeed, Wright's novel provides a further complex literary representation of the historical and social contradictions that Langton observes, and which is implied in Trigger's studies, and one with just as deep a personal connection to mining and its role in Aboriginal Australia's past and present. What is different about the novel, though, is its generic risk-taking, its savage critique of globalised corporate resource exploitation and its explicit valuing of Aboriginal spirituality. So what, what I then go on to, um, to think about in uh, having set this scene, I can perhaps summarise um, um, what um, the, the couple of points I want to make in relation to, because it's a big, Carpenter is a big um, rambling um, <clears throat> innovative um, <coughs> metafictional novel in many ways uh, and it's set as I say in the Gulf country of uh, North, North Queensland um, and its action occurs around 
You can see that little red spot there. I couldn't get it any better than that around uh, what is in reality the Century Zinc Mine, um, which is on Wanyi, um, on Wanyi Territory. And the novel uh, has at its, uh, not at its centre, it's about two thirds of the way through, an, an episode of um, uh, industrial um, sabotage, where one of the Aboriginal, young Aboriginal leaders uh, in the area um, blows up the mine. Will Phantom's his name. But he's based very much on, on the real life, um, in some ways more extraordinary than the, than the character of the novel, the real life of uh, a person called Baram um, <coughs> Yana, who is currently chairman of the Carpentaria Land Council. So and this novel was a very successful novel in Australia and has, been, uh, and has quickly become a world uh, a world novel, if you like, translated into <coughs> Chinese and about 12 other languages, I think, as well. And the, the point I want to make about it, though, was that uh, Lexis Wright came to writing fiction relatively late in her career, after a long career in, um, in Aboriginal activism, being involved with central land councils, writing in, in many different modes for um, the, in the cause of Aboriginal sovereignty and land rights um, legislation and so on. Decades. Uh, of experience in that area, and she decided in the end that that wasn't um, <clears throat> wasn't particularly productive for her, and that what she wanted to do was to write novels about um, Aboriginal Australia, which is what she's currently doing. Marcia Langton, um, <clears throat> in, in some ways, as you can hear from her own account, uh, has has traced a kind of opposite trajectory. That is, away from the cultural and literary origins of her thinking about <coughs> Aboriginal land and spirituality into um, political activism in favour of um, Aboriginal uh, involvement in the mining boom and in the contemporary economic realities of the most important ones, if you like, of contemporary Australia. So, So we might characterise then the, um, the multifaceted narrative of Carpentaria as a fictional representation of the deep ideological and cultural contests at work within the Australian nation since the time of settler sovereignty and into the present, although its relations to realist traditions is complicated by its Aboriginal modes of storytelling and temporality. It reminds us also, I think, put alongside Langton's writing. Uh, of a different understanding of the subterranean forces at work within the region, this region of the world, Carpentaria, that include side by side racialized violence, <clears throat> and but it reminds us, I think, of different understanding of the subterranean forces at work within this region of the world that include side by side racialized violence and unsustainable exploitation the moral priority of development, ideology, and the imperiled survival of ritual, the sacred and indigenous knowledge. The point of drawing Langton's set of writings alongside Wright's fictions is to reveal how the link between the discursive work of indigenous nation building within a troubled white settlement is importantly indexed by the relative presence of the imaginary of mining. We've reached the point at which we promise questions and I can't offer them because we sort of have to have left the room five minutes ago. Um, we originally thought we had a two hour slot and it's gone a little bit um, wrong, so I'm very grateful to Philip for. Unless you want to, unless you don't have to leave instantly. How are you feeling? <laughs> Janet isn't feeling so good and I think we need to let Janet off the book, frankly. So why don't we. No, I'll just say, I'll we'll say some thank yous and then if you have some questions you want to put to the speakers when we're, when we're officially done, then gather around and have a chat. Um, I want to say a couple of thank yous just before we start. One is, Philip's already preempted me, but to Ian Henderson, director of the Menzies Centre, the banner of which is over there, um, who have funded Philip's visit, uh, and Ian's been wonderfully supportive of this session, to Max Saunders and the Arts and Humanities Research Institute for being behind this whole glorious festival that, that's around us, and particularly to Roger <coughs> Pikes for setting all this, this up and making it happen. Um, so let, please just join me again in thanking the speakers.